Welcome to the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast, where we sit down with everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. Welcome to the show, everybody. So today, well, I guess, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break away from my normal rigmarole, at least for that first one sentence. Uh, marinas, they're funny places. Sailors seem to uh, coagulate there. I know that's the worst word to use, but they do. And while I was waiting uh, in the wings, you know, we had the weather come in and all that sort of stuff. But essentially, uh, you meet and greet, you know, fellow sailors are all around. And we ran into a gentleman who had actually come to the presentation. His name is John, and he was on a Pacific Sea craft, a few slips down. So we got to talking, and uh, he agreed uh, to come on the show. And besides the sailing, and he's heading to the Bahamas, the Caribbean, and all that, we get into we get into a little bit of that. But uh, he spent the vast majority of his younger years on the Pacific coast as a uh, kind of commercial fisherman, um, all sorts of different boats and all that sort of stuff. Pretty much since he was like nine years old, which is pretty epic. So we talk a lot about fishing, what's going on out there, what happened back in the day, and uh, and then his future plans with his uh, Pacific Sea Craft. So hopefully you enjoy the show. It's it's pretty cool. I always love marinas because you end up just meeting people, and you know the sailing world is a very tight knit small community. And uh, yeah, John was definitely very cool. He, uh, I broke him away from doing some varnish because he is literally just waiting for a weather window to head over to the Bahamas. And, uh, yeah, he'll be gone probably by the time you hear this. So wish you well, John, and good luck with everything. And who knows, maybe I'll bump into you somewhere in the Caribbean sometime. But other than that, like I always say before I start the show, if you want to help support the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast and future adventures aboard Mighty Sparrow, consider becoming one of the Patreon family, the lovely, wonderful supporters that keep this show going, not only going, but also ad-free for your listening pleasure. Uh, We also have the merch line available, all the shirts. It's Christmas time. Might as well pick one up, but maybe it's too late. I don't know. Maybe it's not. I think they might be able to ship by now. Who knows? Link in the description. And if you just want to reach out to the show, sailingintooblivion.com, podcast button, click on the link that says contact the show. That goes directly to me. And if you have any inquiries about possible yacht deliveries or kind of instruction-y sort of things where I come in on a consultant sort of thing because uh, I don't have any licenses or tickets anymore. They're all expired because I got sick of paying all these yearly dues. Ah, just reach out to the show because who knows, maybe I'm available and uh, I can hop on board and we can uh, share some knowledge. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show and thanks for listening. It's just me. There are no wrong answers. There are no wrong answers, John. Thanks, thanks for joining us, man. This is, and there's always a bit of anonymity. I don't usually use people's last names unless you have a book or something like that. You no. want to promote or anything? Not yet. Not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, can can you just I guess start off? Give us a little little description of this beautiful vessel we're sitting on. Well, it's a boat that was uh, up in the Great Lakes, up in the Upper Peninsula. 1998 uh, Pacific Sea Craft. It was uh, bought new, shipped to the Great Lakes, and then uh, sailed for basically three months out of the year, put in a heated warehouse for the other nine months out of the year. Zero corrosion on it. Zero corrosion. Actually, everything is original on the boat. Gosh, that is, that is amazing. Like yeah. the, the fact that there's no salt water pumping through any pipes, any engines, anything. It was uh, it was amazing. Uh, I kind of... Uh, I think I even undervalued the value of uh, of fresh water, you know, on a boat. Yeah, there yeah, was yeah. no corrosion at all. It, it, you know, they live. I mean, when they're in the ocean, they are essentially being eaten twenty four hours a day. Oh, and yeah. that's what like ninety percent of the maintenance comes from dealing with salt, salt intrusion, and corrosion. It was. Uh, I took it down to the Bahamas. I, I trucked it to Mobile from there, and then took off from Mobile. Went down in the down the Florida coast, and then uh, out to the Keys, and then down the the Bahamas. And I was amazed at how much different the boat was in just six months. 
Oh yeah, I'm you sure. Know? Like seen like rust streaks. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? What? Yeah, I you know? didn't have any of those. So, did you do that single handed? Yeah. Oh I wow, single handed. I uh, took off. Uh, like I say, out of Mobile last uh, beginning of January. Okay. And uh, and uh, went down the Gulf Coast. Went out to the Keys. Um, really like Key West. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my. I've only re- been there one time uh, in my life. Well, the thing about it was Jimmy Buffett actually did a concert there in a small venue, and I chose not to go. Oh, no. <laughs> to this day, I a still regret, regret it because yeah, right? of, of his death, you know? Yeah, <laughs> So it was yeah, one yeah. of his last concerts. Rest in peace, Jimmy. Yep. But then I went to the Bimini, went up to Key Largo, took off out of there in the early morning, middle of the morning. Went to Bimini, pulled into Bimini for a few days, and then uh, went down to Nassau. And, uh, which, uh, uh um, I don't know if Different. I'll go back to that. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we were actually, yeah. we were doing some chart work and, uh, just basic stuff, Latin long with Steph. And, and I was like, Hey, you know, I put some waypoints. I want you to find the lat or I give you, I gave her the Latin longs, but I put all these destinations. And then I was like the last ones, you know, a, a hazard to be avoided. And it was Nassau. Nassau yeah, <laughs> no offense a, to the people of Nassau, but for no, sailors, it's not a great place for a small sailboat. You know, nah, it's not built for us. No, I, it's, I felt like I, I, analogy is a uh, i'm like a little chihuahua in a cow field you know <laughs> just <laughs> you know running around hoping not to get run over you know? yeah yeah it's a busy place too yeah. i don't know i mean you know that that the cruiser lifestyle tends to lean towards you know casual calm you know coves and anchorages you know the biggest hubbub yeah. would be a beach barbecue or whatever yeah well i woke up to five cruise ships came in in one night <sighs> Huge and they're a half mile from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, right. anyways, it was. I was glad to get out. I'm actually glad I went, you know, and experienced it once. But right, I, right. No desire to go back. And then I took off and went down into uh, Exuma, sailed down on. Uh, well, kind of went in and out of the cuts according to the weather. Uh huh. Ended up in Georgetown. Oh, okay. And, uh, How'd you like that? I've never been in the Exumas. Uh, well, I really like the Exumas. It's very busy. I never saw a cruise ship, but I did see a lot of mega yachts. Yeah. And it's a uh, mega yacht heaven in there, haven there. And, um, but it was fine. Um, great places to anchor, great shore life to hike around. And then, uh, down into Georgetown, um, I was meeting my son and my daughter-in-law and one of my grandsons there. So I oh, actually, okay. in the middle of March sometime and uh so i actually had a schedule and a maintenance in a destination yeah yeah and uh so i actually stayed there for five weeks um very easy place to hang out you know yeah um, there is no place to bring the boat to get fuel or water everything is there's no docks that you can go to it's yeah i mean outside so, uh like i know uh uh what's the other one it starts with an e Emerald Cove is just north of there. Oh, okay, okay. About eight miles. But, uh, oh, uh, Eleuthera? Eleuthera. That's Eleuthera. What, I mean, that yeah. seems to have, like, each of the little islands seem to have, like, one spot where it's got a dock. What's that one? It's Staniel or something like that? Well, Staniel's in Exuma. That's in Exuma. That's oh, okay. In I have been to the Exuma. Right. Then, yeah. And, um, memory's going. Yeah. And then, but it's a great place to hang out, and people hang out there for months at a time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, but you got to have a good dinghy, you know. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Everything is done by dinghy, you mm-hmm. know. There. So then there's I pros left. and cons to that too. I mean, I, I definitely enjoy uh, a good anchorage. You know, nice flat. You you kind of feel like your own little island out there. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, yeah, it's nice to be at a marina where you can get out and use the facilities and yeah, get well, they got shower, the- walk around. Well, they have the dinghy dock. You have to, you have to go underneath the bridge in Elizabeth Harbor, they call it. And it's a dinghy dock, and it's the, it's the popular spot. Um, that's where you can get water. Uh, oh, they got okay. one water spout, and everybody uses it. Yeah, yeah. It's good water. And um, there's a store right there, and, and all the you walk to whatever you need. So it is a busy, busy place yeah. for dinghies. Sometimes you can't even find a spot to oh, I'll dinghy, bet, I'll know. bet. <laughs> but, um, Madhouse. You know, there was 357 boats there Jeez. the day I got there. Yeah, all in the anchorage. All in, well, it's for about six miles there. 
about six miles, something like that. You got Stocking Island runs parallel with the main island. Uh huh. So you got this huge like oh like body a fairway of water. almost yeah. And so you can hide from the weather. If the weather is going to come from one direction, you just move from one anchorage over and hide behind the other island. Oh, okay. so it's actually That's a nice, very yeah. convenient spot to be. Does it run uh, north and south or east and west? It runs north and south. Oh, okay. So. Um, yeah, you get strong yeah. easterly trades. I guess it doesn't get, do much for a strong northerly, though. Well, you got a northerly, you can still tuck in, you know. There's little coves there and that, you know. Oh, okay. There was a really, really 30 to 40 mile an hour, um, up to 50, uh, wind the third night I was there. And actually, four catamarans hit the beach. Oh, really? I had to pull them off. Um, if you can imagine... 300 boats anchored all around each other it's like a freaking madhouse it was you know it's not your boat it's your yeah, neighbor's boat it's your neighbor's boat you're wondering and i about, yeah. sat there and listened to people on the radio putting 200 feet of scope out and 10 feet of water Jeez. and the other guy next to him had 75 out well yeah the, right the next morning it was almost comical to listen to the radio people <laughs> oh, themselves you know? everybody's <laughs> wrapped up we always had that down so i worked at the bitter end yacht club in the, the british virgin islands for like 10 years and one of the busiest times for us is always uh christmas eve uh, and new year's eve and our mooring field was about 100 balls and then Saba Rock had its mooring field with like 20 or 30 and then the rest is just people anchored and it's blown like stink because of the Christmas winds and inevitably people are breaking free and the the trouble is they're breaking free upwind of all the 200 foot mega yachts yep and my brother and I there were a couple of years where both times people were dragging or their mooring lines chafed and snapped and we're out there trying to get on these boats that are locked up and drag them around and try and get them safe before they start running into things. And, oh, my God, exciting. Yep. But yep. Uh, chaotic. Chaotic. Well, I kind of had the opposite at Highborn when I was leaving. I ran up on the inside of Eleuthera and anchored in Highborn. I was going to come out of the west, supposedly 10 to 15, which isn't a great anchorage for a westerly wind. Yeah. So I tucked in real close, and there was a mega yacht that was in kind of close for a mega yacht. But I was mm-hmm. behind them, I thought, far enough saw the lightning and it kept getting closer and it went right over us and two boats got hit in the marina there that night but we had all of a sudden my wind gauge went up to 40 45 miles an hour that's a good blow and i came outside and the mega yacht hit either drug or he pulled and he was about 75 feet off my stern sideways between me and the in the shore oh so he's now behind you he was in bad shape he Oof. couldn't go forward he had to back up and he still had his big tender oh geez off the back there was absolute chaos on that boat and uh Dude, that you got having that wiggle room increasing <laughs> yep. your i forget exactly what we used to call it but it was like your you would draw a circle of error or something like that yep. so that you have that buffer zone around you and you always want to increase that you don't want to decrease it yep and I don't know, sometimes that escapes people, I think, when it I, comes to boats yeah. and anchoring and cutting corners and channels and all that sort of stuff. Oh, if, if we'll say with going to a dock, you see people fly it into a dock. Oh, my then, God. Yeah, yeah. Depending on the reverse. But anyways. Some of the funniest YouTube videos I've ever watched. you know. Hey, but they're also, it's almost like watching somebody you know, fall on a skateboard. It's funny to watch, but it also makes you kind of jump uh, and cringe because you're like, oh, that guy's teeth just got knocked <laughs> out. Yeah. Well, it was, it, I think we actually had a funnel cloud go through. Oh, really? Because the wind, you know, it was blowing consistent 20, and then um, it jumped up for about 20 minutes. I came outside. I didn't know what to do. I I knew that I had to be ready for anything, and uh, so I started the engine, turned my lights on so you could see me good. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually pulled my bolt cutters out, my cable cutters out, in case, just in case he hit me. That's, yeah, that's yeah, how, right. How uh, uncertain I was. I didn't know if he was going to get out of his mess. <laughs> and uh, and then 20 minutes later, it was back down to 15 to 20. And and the next morning, I, as soon as daybreak, I pulled the anchor and did that little cut through there. Got on the other side of the island. It's nice and flat. And I'm going, why wasn't I here? Well, yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. But, um, Hindsight's 20 20. I saw three funnel clouds in the first hour on the other side. Oh, really? Yeah, I was Jeez. actually dodging them, and then I realized that maybe I uh, 
need to learn a little bit more about this <laughs> it's a little Caribbean weather. This because, area I have found myself in. Yeah. It's a different well, ocean than the Pacific Ocean where I spent all my life. Yeah, know? yeah. So, I mean, we talking with you last night and the other day about all the all the time you spent, you know, commercial fishing and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't know. You, you're a man of the sea. How, how long? You said you started when you were about nine? Yeah, about nine years old. Uh, my dad was a merchant seaman, and then he had a family and had a job for years. And then uh, um, he bought his first commercial boat when he was in his mid-30s. So I was like six, seven years old, and then I started. My brothers went off to the service. So I ended up becoming my dad's deckhand at nine, and I spent all my time with with my dad Every on the day, boat, yeah, you know, right. fishing. And so wait, what about school, though? Well, I went to school. You went to school. But but there were days I missed. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey, Sam, you know? I'm from Michigan, and uh, come deer season, mm-hmm. there are a lot of, lot yeah. of empty seats at school. I remember that. Yeah. But it was good. It was a good way to grow up. And then I started fishing. My brothers came back, started fishing with my dad, and um, I ended up um, getting my own boat when I was 16. Actually, I was 15 by the time I got it ready. I was 16, so I started uh, fishing for salmon uh, mostly uh, and rockfish off the Central California coast. Um, and this would have been what, approximately 70s? Yeah, early 70s. Early 70s. Um, okay. 72, 73, like that. And uh, I graduated high school in 75, and then I um, I fished and crabbed and. Um, I had another boat. I sold that boat, bought another boat. <coughs> and um, so by the time I was 19, I was already on my second boat, second commercial boat. And yeah, yeah. Fished a lot, you know. Because well, fishing was good back then, right? It was It was a good way of life. Yeah, It was yeah. a good way of life. My brothers, uh, they had boats, and uh, my dad had boats, and, you know, I was a little brother that was running around, and we ran up and down the coast from uh, Morro Bay to Bodega Bay. Um, which is about 200 miles of coastline, and um, fishing salmon for, yeah. in the summertime, and then uh, I'd go back to school. <laughs> right, like oh man, then no between, more money coming in. <laughs> yeah, then between my junior and senior years of high school, I went up to Washington and uh, fished uh, albacore. It was actually a fall, late summer, off of Queen Charlotte between Queen Charlotte Island and Sitka, Alaska. Yeah, which one would you? Which one did you prefer uh, doing, salmon or or uh, I, salmon? Salmon was less uh, labor intensive. No, nah, it just. Uh, uh, I think I've just done it more. Um, there's nothing quite like landing a salmon. Yeah, I mean, you know? what what exactly? What what sort of rig are you using to catch these things? Well, you can you troll around. You have four to six lines you have 40 to or 50 to 35 pound leads on them and you float to it you got outriggers and you put anywhere from five to ten liters on there Snap on each to, line on each line and you're trolling around either herring mm-hmm. or um anchovies or artificial lures you yeah. know one of the you know and it's different ways of doing you have flashers and does you, it ever fill up like you you catch something on each one of those? Uh, the best I ever did was I ran through my gear once and hit 35 fish on the deck. How do you deal with that all alone in one? How do you do that? Um, How do you pull them all in? <laughs> it's, it's uh, well, they're like 18-foot leaders on a snap. You pull them out, the boat doesn't stop, and you unsnap it, and you got a salmon on the other side of an 18-foot leader. So uh-huh. you hand them in, and you gaff them or you net them. And, oh, okay. Uh, put them in the one boat. after another after another. And then, um, so it's a. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Had to do it that way. Seventies um, and early eighties, it started dying out in the mid eighties and out. You know, a lot of restrictions. Right. You know. Well, they were getting uh, overfished too, right? Overfished and uh, regulations. Uh, there was wasn't as many to the water problems that they have in California. Uh-huh. With the rivers and that, right, so right. Um, and is that all like the um, uh, chemicals and stuff and the runoff? Yeah, but it's it, in commercial fishing. You have to have four or five factors all fall into place. You have to have a season. You have to have weather. You have to have uh, the ability to go. 
True. You know, and then you know, as far as the boat ready, and then you have to have fish. You have to <laughs> yeah. have fish. Yeah. And the and other, have and, to be there. And then the other thing that's you know, out there that a lot is the market. True. They, they true. started having strikes, you know, for they started forming uh, fishing associations back in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. So, uh, and the buyers didn't like that. So, well, I, I know, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, 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 a very interesting industry because I've talked to a lot of guys from the East Coast, from like lobstermen to scallopers, tuna guys, all that stuff. And, and knowing some of the history through like all the sword fishing and all that. And just, it's one of those things where the more you catch, the more that gets brought in, the lower the price. So, like, the more you have to go catch. Yep. It's like a catch yep. twenty two. So it's supply and demand. Yeah. It's basic basic economics. And it, it, is there <laughs> any any like way around that besides Well, a lot regulation? of them now are doing direct to consumers, you know. Yeah, you and can that, just buy them straight so from the So you don't fishermen. need as many fish to make a good profit, you know? Right, right, right. But normally you need someone on land to handle that. Yeah. Because you can't do it all. You can't go fish and try to sell it individually, one fish at a time. Oh, yeah. I've done you know? uh, a full day <laughs> pulling lobster pots, and I get back in, and all I want to do is go to bed. Yeah. But you got to go and stack all the all the pots you pulled and all the traps and get mm-hmm. ready for the next day. I could never do it, I don't think, professionally. It was a... Uh, well, not at my age. No, it was a... It's Like I say, it's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's just a lifestyle is what it is. It's a... Uh, you always need something for the boat. There's always a money concern, you know. Just when you yeah. get ahead, something breaks, and it's like, there you go, your profits. I did it till I was in my 30s, early 30s, and then um, with my kids. Things changed to where you used to be able to fish out of one port and pretty make, make a living. And uh, with all the different restrictions and permit fishing, you know, a lot of things got permitted. Yeah. And um, you had to travel. You had to be on the boat and from one port to another, at least on the Pacific coast. Right. And yeah. that's to follow it, not yeah. only the fish, but also like where the regulations where you can, like if one regulation season ends, you can go to the next one sort of thing. Yeah. Or you, you work off of someone else's permit and they work on yours, oh, you know, okay. you kind yeah, of have yeah. a mini co-op between two or three fishermen, right, especially right, right. in herring fishing, you know, when we were fishing herring uh, in San Francisco Bay, uh-huh. you know, which... That, a, that you do with a net, right? Yeah, you do nets, and, um, you know, you're catching the fish for row. Um, you know, and, and back in the late 70s, early 80s, the uh, uh, Japanese dollar was so strong, the yen was uh-huh. so strong that they, they had such a high price for what they wanted. So herring fishing, that's when bluefin tuna took off. Uh-huh. Um, and are they still the most prized fish out there as well, far as yeah, the bluefin, yeah, yeah, you know, but someone told me once that the bluefin went from abundant to, to, uh, endangered faster than any other species uh, of, of animal. Really? Yeah. Because of the, you know, they were paying, you know, 40, $50 a pound in the eighties for bluefin tuna. And some of those you big know? ones back then so, would have been a thousand right. pounds almost. Right. Yeah. 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 Jeez. And, but herring was the same thing. We're catching herring as they're spawning. Yeah. In any industry that that is wiping out the that, spawning yeah, right. fish. It's not giving them a chance. <laughs> you know? And we were doing it just for the row. The rest, right, of, right. rest of the fish was going to uh, to dog food. Now, dog food. is that is that the fish that, like, up in, like, Alaska, when it spawns, it literally changes the whole, the whole color of the ocean, goes white? Like it's all over yeah. the rocks and yeah, the and birds that, are eating. And, and the squid will do that too. The squid, the squid fishery okay. will do that, but uh, they're they're going in and, and um, they're they're looking for eel grass at least down in San Francisco, Tomales Bay area, and they're they come in in the tides and they're going to go lay their legs eggs on the eel grass which is up by the shore. Mm-hmm. So you lay your net between the eel grass and the fish. And, and just scoop and you're scooping them out you know wow. and uh the herring industry um kind of decimated you know, it's similar, self, right. similar like the sardines yeah, and, yeah you yeah, know yeah. And the anchovies but um things are making a little bit of a recovery back there so yeah so, it's i mean it's it is one of those it's a tough game because yeah like you said i mean there's so many catch 22s involved in all of it and i know on the east coast especially back in the 80s when things really started getting bleak the government was like subsidizing 
Oh yeah. Uh, the fishermen to like buy bigger boats and, and mm-hmm. the technology kept getting better and better. So we were able to just keep catching more and more, yep. which again, just brought the price further price and down. further down. So you had to go catch more. Another thing that, uh, talk about subsidies, uh, a lot of fishermen made a lot of money off of the, um, either the oil industry or the uh, fiber optics. They oh. would do soundings, right? Yeah, yeah. And the soundings were, uh, uh, they'd lay these big cables and do a uh, ultrasonic sound or whatever it's called. And um, you couldn't fish then, right? You know, because they wiped out the fishery. So oh. they were forced to pay the fishermen for every lost day. Really? And my dad, that, that was his kind of retirement game. like a cash cow yeah and it was uh every day he couldn't fish he had one day and and he was fishing uh he fished till he was 82 by himself really on his little boat you know, he, he, had, he had multiple boats and he downsized a little fiberglass monterey and um would go out and he had a thousand eighty dollar day fishing halibut one day which was great for his age and yeah that. Well, that was the ticket they used. So every day that they saw Sonic, they wrote him a check for $1,080. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> People, you know, he made a lot of money, but there are bigger boats that made a ton. Yeah, oh, and I'm sure. You know, Jeez. so it was, but it was, you know, it's all part of the that lifestyle. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, know, I mean, you know, any day spent out on the water, even when it's rough or it's mm. ugly or whatever, I, I've always thought, you know, better than... Sitting in an office somewhere with no windows. Yep. And then I, you know, I got out of it and bought a little sport boat, and I just fished for my fish to last ten years on a little twenty foot aluminum boat, taking friends out and oh, nice. going out by myself and fishing. Never gets old. I know. It I know. never gets old. You know? I know plenty of fishermen that uh, they actually like on their day off from going and like being a lobsterman, they'll go out and they'll go fishing for striper or whatever, any anything. They just want to get back out they, there and catch something. Uh, good story with my dad. He he went one year before he bought his last boat. He had it. He did have a boat one year, and I found him at like seventy seven years old out in the surf surf fishing for perch <laughs> oh, really <laughs> because he was in a, in a bucket right he yeah was, he'd five gallon bucket of perch he'd take them over and sell them but that's that's a guy that loved fishing <laughs> yep. There, yep well there's yeah. something yeah. fun about it you know i i used to do a lot of you know just a little lake fishing up up in michigan and now the only fishing i do outside of trolling you know a line behind my boat when i'm out you know cruising from one place to mm-hmm. another right. and that i'm usually it's either tuna or uh, mahi mahi. That's usually all I ever catch. Right. But up north in Michigan, uh, we go up into these lakes, way way up in the Upper Peninsula near Canada, and you're going after like pike and walleye, all these right. lake fish. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, it's one of those things. You, a lot of people would think it's just boring. You're sitting there, you're casting most of the time. You're not catching a single thing. It is like therapy. Oh yeah. Just being. You're already in this beautiful natural setting you know sitting in a canoe or whatever Mm -hmm. and it's just this like i don't know there's this rhythmic hypnotic thing to it and then all of a sudden it gets broken when something bites it and it's like excitement and wow and all this stuff and then you know we usually let them go and just do it again that's a good thing when i the last four or five years i got hooked up with two two guys he one guy had a lake boat one guy had a river boat river drift boat for fishing uh, steelhead and salmon and oh river. okay yeah yeah and then i had the ocean boat so we we fished 12 months out of the year you know <laughs> right, doing right. something you know yeah, yeah so yeah. they were kind of upset when i took off and uh and um they lost their ocean gig and when you, you switch know? to the blow boat <laughs> you know oh geez i like it a lot i started sailing about 10 years ago in san francisco bay and I think I, I mentioned earlier that I had to wait. As a joke, I had to wait till my dad died. Yeah, you know before I know. I he still rolled over. <laughs> I'm know? sure. I'm sure he is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, like I say, it never gets old being on the water, and I kind of like it because there is no pressure to catch fish. No, you know? being no. an old commercial fisherman, if you didn't catch fish, 
it wasn't a good day. Yeah, yeah. There right. was no, no oh, true, it was a beautiful true. day out there. I didn't catch anything. No, it was an upsetting day. A <laughs> good know? day on a sailboat is pretty much right. like, I, for me, my, my favorite conditions, I, you know, barring some of the sailing that I've done in the past, for me is a, like a perfect condition day it would be 12 to 15 knots yep. on the beam, slight swell coming from astern open ocean for a couple hundred miles around me and and that's all i get like perfect i i i will dream about that and think of all the times that i've had it uh for the rest of my life i love that i i, I agree but <laughs> what percentage of the days are like that <laughs> down in the southern ocean uh not many not many you know? surprisingly though you know down there it's it's a rhythmic sort of thing it's just a rhythm of the low pressure system yeah. so you know you you know you're gonna have one just about every week come in depends on how strong it is how intense things are gonna get but in between you'll usually have you'll usually have a day or two where the winds are moderately good out of the north before the next one hits you yeah but there is a devil's calm in between each one where you're gonna sit for almost a whole day wow. and wallow in the never-ending swell of the southern ocean there's like a predominant southwest swell that you know sometimes it's huge sometimes it's you know only 10 feet it's a mile in between it sometimes it's crazy mm -hmm. not quite a mile but close yeah. um but man it rocks your boat and you're sitting there, and when you don't have the capability to motor, you're just waiting, and you're waiting in a place you don't want to be lingering at all. Right. And and I think Bernard Montissier used to say, you know, he doesn't like gales, but calms like undermined his soul or, or something, something yeah. for that matter. And I I totally agree. I mean, a calm, especially when the the sea is not calm is just absolutely maddening all you want to do is just to change what's going on and there's nothing you can do right it's an ugly mm. ugly sort of situation but <laughs> but yeah that's why you give me those 15 knots i'm powered up but i'm not overpowered and no yeah. squalls on the horizon like that's and the the only thing that makes it even better is if i know i'm going to get the full moon rising you know yep. when it gets dark right. oh, sailor's best friend yeah, full moon you know a good night Full moon sailing is uh, oh, it's it's hard it, to beat. It's the best. It's you, so hard to beat. World's you know? lit up. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely um, phenomenal. Yeah, well, most cruisers, you know, as you know, they don't sit out the comms, you know. They just start the motor and go. True, and Myself true. included because I seemed like I had to, this last trip, I you know, I felt like I had to be somewhere. Right, Make a right. cut during the. So one thing about going in and out of Exoma is all about the cuts and hitting them well, at the right tides, you know? That, that's what I was going to say. The tides are really strong, and you, yep. you kind of drifting there. You're not just kind of sitting in one place without anything you can bump into. Right. Drifting there, you're you're moving quick and yep. towards something, usually. Yeah, and I had to really get used to uh, being in the Caribbean here and down in here, being used to being under 10 feet of water. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, that was a that was probably one of my hardest things to get over. What, is, what does she draw? She draws five. Oh, that's not but, too bad. There you go. Um, in the Pacific Ocean, fishing, right? If you're under twenty feet of water, you're in danger. <laughs> you yeah, know? right. Most of the time, well, because you, know? you guys have not those in big danger. Swells coming in yeah. too, right? But nobody goes in that close, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, um, that was one of my biggest um, uh, fears to overcome. You know, right, right. Was getting used to traveling with two feet under the cable keel or something. <laughs> you know? See, and I'll tell you, so on on Sparrow, my my Westdale, I don't have. There's no depth sounder on there. Okay. And you know, I I'm normally in the middle of an ocean, so it never matter. It it's never mattered to me. And all the Caribbean time that I've spent on that boat has been down in the you know the island chain from the the Virgins down to uh, like uh, Saint Lucia. Okay. So there's really no spots where I'm like, oh man, and you can you can see the bottom when you're in those places. I've never, if I were in the Bahamas, I think I would probably want to make sure I had a transducer that worked. Yeah. And uh, I could at least gauge it because you know the last time I was taking my boat up to the Buf or Beaufort area to haul it out, I had to anchor one night on the intercoastal, and it's all muck. You can't really see the. Uh, see through the water and I ended up having to tie a weight to a line and do a sounding mm -hmm. around the boat to make sure I wasn't gonna 
yeah. go high and dry. Yeah. And I was kind of like, this is, this is kind of cool because it's old timey. <laughs> but at the same time, I kind of wish I knew exactly what was under my keel. Yeah. Yeah. I I could imagine traveling through without a without my depth sounder. Yeah, know, it's I, a little... It would, it would I have to stay right in the middle and just barely give way. I mean, luckily, uh-huh. you know, uh, a West Sales keel is is like a... Yeah. It's yeah. it's super strong, so you're not worried about damaging the boat if you run aground, but you're you're worried about getting stuck there. You know? Yeah. Well, I had two groundings. Two groundings. Um, leaving when I left uh, Mobile, one was in Pensacola. Mm-hmm. How bad? It that one was pretty bad actually. I was anchored up, and there was one little spot that had two foot on it. This whole big anchorage. Yeah, I was well away away from it. Pulled the anchor. Was doing some stuff with the sails. Kind of, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, and I drifted right onto it. Oh, no. The one little dot of two foot water, <laughs> and I hit it. You know. And then I was going into a marina that supposedly had seven foot in Panama City. Mm-hmm. Grounded hard. Oh, really? Right, right going into the entrance, turned and managed to get out of that. And uh, called him up and said, oh, well, sorry about that. <laughs> you know? Oh, my bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well. So It happens. And you know. So, anyways, it was, so I did ground, which to me was uh, being a Pacific Coast guy. Uh, groundings were were uh, not something you'd want to do. No, no, no. Well, I'll bet you, I mean, I would think they would be similar to anybody that grounds up in, like, Maine. Because in Maine, if you hit bottom, you've hit a ledge, which means your boat is now compromised and damaged oh, and needs okay. to be hauled out. You know, you, you, you run aground down here in the intercoastal Carolinas, you're just going into silt and mud. Right. So it's not really a huge deal, right. you know. It happens all the time, but yeah, there are places where, and I'm assuming that the Pacific Coast is pretty much rock, right? Yeah, there's a you'd be lucky to hit sand. <laughs> yeah, you know? right. You know? <laughs> Let's put it that way. Which you makes, know? I mean, it makes that whole area quite challenging because there really aren't a, a huge amount of inlets from, I guess, Seattle down to no. San there's Diego. only there's only a handful of Mar- of um, of harbors between say santa barbara which is north just north of la Mm -hmm. you go around conception and then you have uh, one two three you got about six harbors all the way to the oregon coast wow yeah it's a lot of miles you know when you're when you're traveling there's a lot of times it's 80 miles and there's no anchorage you know like from Morro bay up to to uh, Monterey. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of spots so you can go in, um, hide behind a kelp patch, but, you know, it's not a great spot. Yeah, that dulls the seas, though, a bit. The breakers, right? Yeah, yeah, right there by Big Sur area. Uh Uh-huh. We used to run from Morro Bay to to uh, Monterey quite a bit, and it was about a 14-hour run, and we'd take off, and my dad was always trying to get some last-minute sleep, and, and so... For some reason, I always was on watch going around Point Sur. Uh huh. Point Sur is one of the big points off of there. Off Isn't that a big surf spot? There's some surf there, you know. Um, it's a highly reclusive area, uh, hard to get to. The Highway 1 is uh, prone to landslides, mm-hmm. so the roads are, are um, impassable for a lot of the time. But going around Point Sur, there's a little buoy right there, and I've I've always said it's the loneliest place on earth because we always seem to hit it about two, three in the morning. When I was on watch, <laughs> yeah, and right. I had to get around this little point, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we were miles from anywhere, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I, they'll always be in my memory of of uh, the buoy off Point Sur. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that reminds me of uh, uh, I forget what the shoal is, but it's basically right off of Cape Fear. So when you're going from Beaufort down to Charleston. Essentially, the only thing you got to get around is Cape Fear and yeah. that little point. But yeah. you know, you've got—I well, guess it would be probably uh, 80 miles or so on either side of it before you've yeah. got safe, safe refuge and stuff like that. Yeah, I've seen a chart. Pretty lonely. It, it, yeah, it looks yeah. like a, a lonely stretch. It's kind of neat. Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of like there's these little indentations in the coast all the way going down to Charleston and. But it's a you know it's a notorious area, but you're well inside of the Gulf Stream at that point, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But 
I've I've definitely seen some pretty ugly weather in that area, and it it can whip up really yeah. fast. Well, that's the thing about the points. Uh, you got Point Reyes, Point Sur, and uh, um, Conception, and generally the waves are twice as big and twice close together at the points. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They just they just stack right there, you know. So mm-hmm. trying to get around them sometimes is. Uh, a little, yeah. little extra wiggle room is uh, always uh, yeah. a nice thing to have when yeah. you're doing that, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's pretty amazing how waves can heap up when they, when they hit areas like that. I mean, it's you know, it's very interesting coming in and out of these inlets. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, as an ocean sailor, obviously, I, I just don't, I don't do much of that, and to see the drastic change. Uh, between the day, the first day when we went out, and and this happened last time I was down here with Mark and Steph, we went out on one day where you know it was flooding, and we thought, oh yeah, or it was it was ebbing, and we were like, yeah, let's go out on the ebb. It'll toss us right out there. We'll be going mm-hmm. with it. But there was you know some waves out there, and that little area right at the entrance to that inlet was just chaos. Yes, yes and we're yes. just like, holy cow! And so you know you. It's a skill to be learned, and by the time we got to the last the last day we went out yesterday, I mean we went out on the right at slack, and it was you know a little up and down, but nothing to speak of. But coming back in, and there was probably six seven foot swell, but because we came in on the flood with the the current just ate that swell away, yeah, and it was flat as paint. We sailed in with the staysail and main, and just looked great. Yeah. Everybody else had no sails on. They're wobbling mm-hmm. all over the place, and we're just like, Fring. Tough way to be. Well, that that was one thing I, I had to really learn this last year was uh, was going in and out of the inlets kind of determined my day, you know. And it, it lasted, timing, yeah. The timing yeah. of them, you know, and, and do that, especially in Exuma, you know, they're trying to go in and out of those cuts. Oh, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they're narrow. They're narrow. And, and that's uh, all the cuts they, in between the reefs, right? From one side to the other, you know, or the you know, yeah, you know, you're trying yeah. to get on the outside, and um, so um, it was one of those that um, always nervous going through them, you uh-huh. know, even if it's nice. But but uh, I'd rather sail in the open ocean at night and hit a cut in the day, yes. than the other way around. Oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, hope no. too. I remember when when I did pull out uh, and pull into Beaufort this this last May. Uh, I'd never been in there before, and, you know, I arrived at maybe 1 in the morning in that area, Mm -hmm. and there was, you know, military or naval operations going on just south of me. I just wanted to get off of the ocean. It was really lumpy, and it was windy, and... But I've never been in there before, and I was like, "Hell no, I'm not gonna. I'm not going in until I can see what I'm looking at." So yeah. I hove to out there for like four hours until the first light, and then started making my way in. And I was yeah. glad, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was dead tired when I finally pulled into Oriental. I pretty yeah. much collapsed, but well, you made it safely. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, yeah, no. I, I tell people a lot of times one of the the greatest lessons that uh, ocean sailing has taught me is just patience. You know. Yeah. Don't ever be in a hurry. I mean, you're already on the boat, so right. you might you should be enjoying your time. I mean, this is what people dream about, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but man, yeah, I, I don't know. It is. Uh, it's an amazing uh, way to to sort of spend a day. I think. Well, I've I've uh, I've been doing. I've been living on the boat for a year now. I uh, kind of left California and got rid of all my stuff and um, and been on the boat and enjoying it a lot. Yeah, a yeah. lot, you know, and uh, meeting people like you, and and uh, meeting Mark people and like Mark, you, you know, <laughs> and, uh, like people, you know. I mean, I mean, as far as like wise people, you know, yeah, like minded, and, and uh, right, I haven't run into anybody that uh, really wasn't helpful, and and uh, and um, and that we got along fine, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, well, there's I, there's always different types, uh, you know. There's there's the dreamers that always talk about going out and doing it, and they don't really ever make it, but they're always talking about it. And and I think that's great. They enjoy, obviously, they enjoy being on a boat, being a sailor, even yeah. if they don't leave the dock. And they like tinkering because that's all they seem to do. And uh, you know, the fact that they've got that dream, hey, it's awesome, and they're yep. fun to talk to. And usually, they're the 
the best people to take you know questions about your tech because they <laughs> they've got six AIS you know aerials on the back of their boat and you're like hey you install these all day long give me uh, give me some tips but and I even I even find uh, joy in talking to you know like sort of the sailing blowhard the one who's always got the biggest baddest yeah. stories yeah. and make sure you've heard them and all that I I don't know I used to really not like that. I would, I would just, I'd walk away from people like that. And now, I don't know if it's, I'm just getting older and I just enjoy more moments because I know we don't have too many yeah. left. But I like listening to them. And inside, I'm kind of giggling sometimes. And I'm like, oh yeah, it was blowing, it was blowing 85, huh? You, you had yeah. your full sails up because you just wanted to see. <laughs> but yeah. I nod and smile. It's all good. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. It reminds me of uh, when I was because I was a kid on the I was known as little Johnny on the dock, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of days we didn't fish, and uh, next thing I know we're in a in a card game on you know at the fish house, you know. And I was dealing with these old fishermen, and the stories would just go. Yeah, you know? oh, I'll <laughs> just bet. go I'll off, bet. you know. <laughs> and uh, competitive stories, you know. Commercial fishermen are highly competitive yeah oh yeah you know it's all about the count yeah it's all about the count and and he should never have beat me or i should i should have more you know do you so. remember any of the best ones the biggest whoppers you ever heard oh i not right not off hand but um you know i was pretty competitive myself you know <laughs> at the time <laughs> and especially with my brothers yeah, you know, yeah my yeah. older brother i i found a lure that nobody else had fished. i tried something different and I was catching, you know, 15 to 20 salmon, which was pretty good days, you know? Yeah. And my brothers and my dad were, um, they were catching four or five, right? You know, and this went on for a week. Uh oh. And, uh, were you letting them know about it? I wouldn't tell them. Good man. <laughs> I, I, good I man. did not tell my old brothers what I was yeah, using. Yeah, right. You know? right. So that's the type of competition. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, there's, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, have you ever heard of, uh, that captain linda greenlaw yeah she's yep. yeah she's mm -hmm. one of the best sword boat captains yep. ever sort yep. of thing and uh was credited to be one and uh there she wrote a book called the hungry ocean and it, it sort of has like a double narrative sort of thing but the one narrative is is just one trip the trip where i think bob brown passed away after it or something like that yeah. and um but one of the things is she's just absolutely killing it out there and everybody else is kind of like eh, the fish is not that good and one of her crew gets on the horn and is chatting with one of his friends on one of the other boats and they ask you know so how's it been going he's like oh we've been nailing them da, da, da. and she hears it through the ball can and comes out and it's like what the f are you doing da, da, da. and all of a sudden everybody knows like because they say there's kind of that unwritten rule of like, you know, fishermen, we're all out here together. If, you know, if anybody's getting on them real good, let us all know so we can all feed our families. Right. But at the same time, like you're saying, there's a competitiveness. Yeah. Well, we, you know, before cell phones, you know, everything was done by the radio. Yeah, yeah. So you would have code words and stuff like that with other, with your little click of uh, oh, fishermen. Oh, right, 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 right. You would never say it on the radio, but you would say it on the radio. The queen of clubs <laughs> you know? is jumping around you know? the jack. <laughs> yeah, you know. So there was a lot of that that went on in the 70s and 80s. And like I say, oh, cell phones but... changed all that and communication. Oh, you know? I'm sure, so, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about it because you really couldn't have a private conversation no, back in the day. No, no, you know. So, eavesdropping everywhere. You know, you'd have secret channels, you know. We would actually, we had to, back in the old CB days, um, you had to have call letters, right? Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. still remember my dad's call, call letter, KDP 6299. Right? Nice. And we would go unit one, call in unit two, and that meant switch to a different channel. Uh -huh. and, and I still remember a guy named Slim, uh, had, a, had a fishing boat, old guy, and he just railed me on the dock. Why don't you ever answer your dad? He's always calling you. <laughs> 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 And you never come back. <laughs> you never come back. <laughs> you know? What the heck? <laughs> little so, did he know. There are little things like that. It was, like I say, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, fun yeah. Back bet, then, you know. Bet. So, but um, yeah. yeah. Do you Think, keep up on what's going on with it? Uh, the fisheries out there anymore? Oh yeah, I still uh, subscribe to all the 
news uh, updates and that, you know. Yeah. I still know a few guys that fish, you know, but uh, mostly what I did was just sport fish. I got to the point to where I just enjoyed catching. Yeah, you know, I yeah. didn't want the pressure of having of, to, of, yeah. You know, because it really, it's it's a game changer. It it makes, you know, everybody says every day on the ocean is great. No, it's not when you're a commercial fisherman. Yeah, it's going to make or break you. You know, so, um, um, you know, you miss out on on fishing opportunities and it's it's pocketbook you yeah know? yeah, it's, yeah it's, exactly it's how you make your living, your living you know yeah. so um, well i know that um there was a lot of talk about you know the fisheries throughout the entire ocean essentially you know you've got if they if they took certain areas uh, and i think i want to say the phoenix islands in the south pacific and i, well, I don't think they're in the south pacific but in the yeah. pacific ocean uh had sort of uh, experimented with like shutting down, completely shutting down big areas to fishing, mm-hmm. and then seeing what the effects would happen to all the surrounding areas. And I believe what they were finding was that in a protected area would then become the nursery, and then these fish go out, and all of a sudden the fish populations in all the areas where you could actually fish would go way up. But they needed that protected area where they were never getting fished. To sort of cycle in the new and allow allow yep. for the reproduction and and all that. I'm a big believer in that. And, uh, yeah. And um, exclusion zones, they call them. Yeah, they they did them, and I think we were talking last night about diving. And that yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, the difference, and that's I, I think they work great. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately for the fishermen and the big opposition for that, yeah. it was always the best spots to fish. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. but. The reason we're able to fish, there's so many boats now. There's so much pressure on fish. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I see it here, you know, and and uh, really at Florida, uh, California pales in comparison to what's going on here in Florida. Really? Yeah, as far as boats, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I look around and see all these sport boats, and I just, you know, wonder... And they're shooting right yeah. out to the old yeah. Gulf Stream, yeah. yeah. And yeah. they're going after the predatory fish, you yeah. know, sunfish or sailfish, mm-hmm. and and do they get swordfish down here? Yeah, I guess they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. do. I've heard a couple couple of the commercial boats over here, right, uh, right, talking about swordfish and, and fresh swordfish. What's happening also is uh, is uh, I believe the kayak fishery fishery in uh, California, on the Pacific Coast. Mm. I used to kayak fish. I talk about loving fishing, you know, when I yeah, didn't yeah. have a boat, I got yeah, a kayak well, and used to go out. I ran out of gas. <laughs> yeah. Give me that kayak. <laughs> and I used to kayak fish and abalone dive off it. But it just, now it's it's hundreds and hundreds of boats. Yeah. And they're all fishing the rookeries. They're all fishing close by. They're fishing the kelp beds. Right, you know? right, right. And uh, it's had a negative effect on, on the fish population there. Yeah. yeah. But, you know. I think, you know, in in the end, it'll probably just end up being one of those things where, you know, people as a whole need to make a choice of whether or not we want to eat all the fish now and then have just, you know, decades of nothing. Like, it's not all the fishing boats rot in the docks. Or we start to protect little areas and start really trying to balance and manage it, you know. I mean. Yeah. I, I think it's manageable. I don't know if it's manageable, but it. If everybody was a law-abiding fisherman, <laughs> <laughs> it could be manageable. It would be manageable, yeah. I'm a, you know, and I, this is a guy that fished since I was seven years, eight years old. I believe that uh, poachers should be m- harshly, harshly penalized. Oh, they'd yeah, be stripped you know, completely you know, of their, you know, ability but, to fish for the rest of their lives, yeah, I would think. You know, but Probably gonna get that's killed not now. the case. And then what ends up happening is... Well, he got away with it, you know. Yeah, I better, I I better well push it, it right, you know. Right. And so, anyways, it's yeah, it's a sticky I'm, one I'm, for sure. Whatever ha- goes onto my hand lines now on the back of the sailboat is all I really care about. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> I, I can just picture you lighting up, you know, like ooh, is that so? For I see you've got you've got some small poles, but like if you're if you're on an offshore passage or whatever, or say you're cruising across the Gulf Stream. Do you just hand line off of a, a cleat? Last year, I just put some hand lines off of there. I got some dolphins, some Spanish mackerel. Um, I wasn't too um, uh, interested in fishing that much. I had enough to learn the boat, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had plenty to keep me busy. 
And uh, but this year I did buy a new pole and and I'm a little offshore reel, a good off, offshore reel. So oh, nice, I'm, nice. And I bought there some new, new uh, feathers and yeah, yeah. And uh, I've actually polished up my dad's old. Uh, he had some bone uh, tuna jigs made out of uh, bone. Oh, okay. Which in the old days those were the best, you know. They're really, actually kind oh, of a collector's item. So yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna see if I can't catch a. What do you make them out of? Like chicken bones or something? No, I, you know, I don't know, but they're big. You know, they're, 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 they're six, eight inches long. It's, oh, wow. It's, it's okay. got to be a good sized bone. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, of of something. Of you know? something. <laughs> but they, they evidently have the great floating characteristics in that. So oh, just perfect. Good. Yeah, so yeah. I put new hooks on them, and I'm hoping to just do it out of more symbolic than anything. Yeah, else, yeah. You know, if I can catch one fish on it. That's, you know, happy, uh, you know, for so. me, yeah, I mean, usually, you know, well, always now, especially after my first voyage of kind of running out of food, I've, I've always have a lot of that doomsday prepper food on, on board. I have yeah. like about a four month supply before I even put the first can of provisioning on my boat for a trip. Okay. It's just always there. And, and sometimes I kind of feel like, you know, I don't need to fish all the time because I got I ha- already have all this food. I don't I don't you know, I kind of I, I don't really feel bad about taking the life of a fish to mm-hmm. eat it. Um, but still, I'm kind of like, well, if I got all this food, I might as well let the fish live for another day. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I like to I like to at least get, you know, maybe one fish per trip. And uh, usually it's a Dorado or a, yeah. uh, a Dorado and Mahi Mahi. That's the same. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, if I catch one, then I try and catch the other one because they're that type that don't they mate for life? Yeah, they stick yeah, together. That, yeah. That's what I've been told. Yeah, who who knows? Who knows? For sure. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's hard to does study anybody, those things. Has anybody really anybody asked follow, them? You know? Yeah, what have they said yeah. about this controversy? But <laughs> yeah. but you know, on that, uh, it was kind of funny talking about making your own your own uh, equipment I, well, on that trip around the world. I did. I finally ran out of of lures that that I had, but I had packed at least a bunch of hooks, and I had a couple of beer cans, you know, empty ones left on the boat. And I cut them into little squid type looking things, mm-hmm. and they work better than the oh yeah better than yeah, the yeah. plastic you know fancy colored lures and so they were shiny so yeah. you know they were sparkling and you get into that sargasso seaweed patchy area right. and it's kind of a pain because you keep picking it up mm-hmm. so you have to clear it off but if you if I saw them chasing the flying fish and I threw mine in there was one instance where in under a minute I had that fish and I was like wow. Yeah, that felt pretty good. It does feel good. It, 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 it does. You know, every fish I got, I was happy and proud of. You know, and it's a, and it's a tasty and, uh, treat. Yeah. You know, we so. we caught a uh, a kingfish on the last delivery I did from Maine down to Charleston. We caught it right yeah. out outside of Beaufort, and the guy cooked it up, and holy smokes, it was good. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he did like steaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you steaks. know, after eating a bunch of. Heavily processed food. It's a, a welcome, yes, it a is. welcome mix. So, well, I'm hoping to do more this year. I've kind of concentrated on more. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I got the boat a little better figured out. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll do a little fish. So, do you, in, in sort of closing, you want yep. to tell us about the upcoming adventure? Well, I am going to go. Um, I've been here for six months. So I finally figured out that uh, maybe I better learn this boat and, and upgrade it the way I wanted it. And uh, did a lot to it. I can't even tell you how much I did, but um, I'm ready to go. I'm gonna scoot out and go over to the Bahamas at the first cross, first weather window I get. Yeah. And um, sail down through. Uh, I really want to go through Exuma again. That was my favorite island, or uh, Eleuthera. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna go down Eleuthera, then over to Cat on the south, and then. Um, hop over to the Turks and Caicos even though that may not be the best place for a five foot draft sailboat but I know getting you in know? I've been in there once we came in in a catamaran yeah. and so we, we it was pretty easy for us but there was there was one area that's pretty dicey I think they mark it with not only channel marks but yeah. like buoys like and fenders and everything because it's a real right. it's squirrely to get yeah. in there yeah I know I a lot know. of whales though around that area. Is there? Yeah. What tons. type of whales? I want to say they were humpbacks. I can't okay. remember, but I think that was sort of their winter time retreat. They would go down there. We saw at least ten of them as we approached wow. going in there. I was okay. like, wow. And I guess they do whale watching trips and everything there. Out of, out of there. Yeah. Okay. 
And then uh, I may pick up my one of my sons may fly out. He wants to do a, a two week uh, trip with me, so we may go from there and head to the Dominican Republic, mm-hmm. skirt around the Dominican Republic, and then go to um, south side of Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. Come around, he'll probably sail uh, fly back out of Puerto Rico, and then I have another couple that uh, are good friends going to meet me in uh, Puerto Rico. And they've always wanted to sail to the Virgin Islands. Mm, nice. So we're going to sail up to the Virgin Islands, go through the Spanish Virgin Islands. and uh, Calabria. Calabria, yeah. yeah. That's they, got such a nice harbor. Yeah. I've, I've, what I've read. That natural. Yeah, it's, it's basically a C-shaped island. I mean, it is open to the east, so it's open to the trades. But yeah. there's a huge amount of protected area in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh and then they'll get off, and then my other son, I have twin boys, and he's coming with his wife and my five-year-old granddaughter, and we're going to spend two weeks with me, and uh, I'm going to be in St. Thomas on the 19th of March. That's oh, my, okay. That's my only schedule. That's your schedule. <laughs> nice. And then drop them off, and then I'm going to make a decision at that point where I really want to head down to Grenada. Oh, okay. Go down through the islands and then uh, put the boat up. Um, for hurricane season in uh, down there in Prickly Bay or somewhere. Do a little pop over in the BVI? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. I hey, might know. as well. Because Virgin Gorda, when you when you want to head south, um, you check out in Spanish Town, you know, the night before yeah. or whatever. And then you can, from North Sound, you know, you get a nice, great night's sleep, super protected. North Sound, you can take the channel to go to the north side of Virgin Gorda, and once you get around Pajaro's Point, nothing but ocean. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's... you're and you're as far east as you can be before you know St. Martin or anything like that. Yeah, that's where I would always hop out. It just gives you essentially it gives you like a ten mile head start both east and north uh, to just aim your way right where you want to go which yeah. grenada you know for this right. boat what grenada in four days or something yeah something yeah. like that i can take my time I, I i did a lot of diving for a few years down in that area oh uh, that's right i'm yeah. telling you stuff and you've been down there <laughs> dominica dominica was was my favorite island it, but, uh, it's uh, one of mine it's, too uh, yeah and, and it's kind of where i got inspired i think i told you i met a guy frenchy him and i ended up becoming friends and uh that was uh, inspired me to start sailing about sailing. 12 years yeah, ago yeah. and um well the french so, love their sailboats oh he, yeah. he was yeah bernard motissier did a he, lot for that he, uh, that whole industry over there yeah he was uh so i'm hoping to uh put the boat up in grenada and then maybe this time next year i'm going sitting in grenada trying to figure out what to do from there Heck so, yeah. yeah, sounds pretty good. All right, well, John, All right. thank you for coming on the show, man. I wish you the best of luck. Hopefully you have uh, fair winds and following seas. Yeah. And uh, other than that, who knows, probably bump into each other again somewhere down the line. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so, and thank you very much. And uh, um, my brief time talking to you, I've, I've learned a lot just just talking to you. Well, so don't trust you. me all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, thank you, John. Have a good day.